Hello, uh, welcome to Obtaining Tiger Data from Esri. My name is Mark Young. This is GIS 101, Fall Semester 2012. In this video, we're going to discuss a very important data source that we use in GIS called the Tiger Data, which stands for Topologically Integrated Geographic Encoding and Referencing System. Um, and the uh, Esri site set up in the year 2000 a very nice uh, download site where you can obtain the tiger files in an already processed format um, turn into shape files already so that you don't have to do any converting and even though there are, is more recent data available including up to tiger 2011 now I believe we're going to focus initially on getting our data from Esri and later we'll move into um, some of the other sources and in your GIS 220 classes you'll use the uh, Census Bureau a lot for obtaining Tiger data. So one, one of the advantages again from the Esri side is that the data has already been processed and they also have attribute data available from the summary files the uh, SF1 in particular and it has a lot of information in it um, from the year both the years uh, 1990 and the years uh, 2000 so it's a very handy data source and by being processed in that manner it saves us a lot of time and effort and allows us to focus more on learning about the tiger data how it's how it's represented and how we can use it um, and obtain it in a more efficient manner. Another advantage is it already has um, been processed down to a county level of detail. So you don't have to download like for example the 2010 Tiger data is available with the summary file already included in it from directly from the Census Bureau site through a test that they're doing but it comes down as one large download file for the entire country and it's also available only at the track level of detail um, I do think they have some county levels of detail as well but with the by obtaining it from the Esri site you have the flexibility of getting it down to uh, a variety of levels of detail including the county tracks block groups blocks and so forth so you got more flexibility there for for getting the data data at a level of resolution that may be more suited to your needs so that's uh, that's why we're going to use it from Esri to start with and like I say you will be learning about obtaining it directly from the Census Bureau as well if not later in this class then in the 220 class so let's proceed here I've uh, typed out the address. I'm going to highlight it for you here. Uh, be sure to write this down. Uh, this may be a little difficult to find. The Esri has a lot of census data that they sell as well. And a lot of times when you do a Google search, it will take you to that data instead of this uh, free data source. So uh, be sure to write down this address here. I'll pause just a minute to give you time to do that. And if you follow this address, it will take you to this site here. And uh, you can see it says free data up here in the upper left. And this is kind of a, think of this as like a, a brief metadata page for your, for your data that you're going to be using. And notice it does have the coordinate system with the projection information we need. It's in geographic, so that's GCS, geographic coordinate system of NAD 1983 for most of the, most of the country. Uh, Alaska and some of the old Hawaii areas, uh, uh, the old Hawaiian datums use uh, the NAD uh, 27, is what it says here. So, um, so when you when you get to this site, if you follow this link right here where it says preview and download, that will take you to a, a page that uh, shows the uh, the country here. Let you select a state. And again, remember, we're looking at the 2000 Tiger data here in this case. So we're going to just, uh, for fun, we'll select and download a sample data set so you can see how this works. So I'm going to pick Tennessee. And 
you can see it takes us to a dialogue where we can select either by county or by layer. Now let me tell you a little bit about the types of information. Let's actually let's just go into a county first and then I will discuss it just a little bit. We'll just go into Cumberland County. And you can see here they have a list of a lot of different layers that are that come from the tiger shape files. And I mentioned before that they have some information from 1990 as well. And what the tiger data is is think of it as basically um, bounding polygon and line features for a variety of different things that the Census Bureau uses to put data into for the most part. For example, we've got we've got block groups. Um, block groups, census blocks, and census tracts are all uh, entities that the Census Bureau uses when it aggregates and summarizes the uh, information it collects from the, the census every 10 years. So for example, they, they'll have population figures in there by a whole variety of different uh, different classifications by age groups, by race, um, and so forth. But they have all this available again at these the the finest level of detail in terms of the smallest area that you can get information on is the census block. Now the census block tends to be uh, included in, and, and we'll talk more about this a lot in the 220 class but there's specific guidelines that they use to define these census blocks and these census blocks change periodically and that's why the Census Bureau is constantly updating the Tiger data in fact they'll update it even more frequently than the than the biennial census that comes out every 10 years they will um, they will uh, update this through there's uh, political processes involved in a lot of cases how they update some of these uh, entities but basically they, they've got some guidelines that we won't go into too much detail right now on but they'll they'll define these blocks down to the that's their finest level of detail and it's basically just a polygon feature that shows geographically where these different blocks are located okay the data the attribute data is collected in what we call summary files. Now summary files are basically just DBF files in many cases um, that contains just the raw data that's collected and again this this data gets summarized by a whole lot of different geographic uh, entities. So again that would include like the blocks, the block groups, which are basically a conglomeration of different blocks. So it's it's a it's a larger area, and then the census tracts, which is probably one of the more popular levels of detail, is um, basically a conglomeration of the census block groups. Um, so they and they and they may be bounded by different features, like they might follow roads, for example, is a common feature. Uh, sometimes they'll follow streams. A lot of times they'll aggregate upward to eventually they reach the county level of detail, which you'll see is another layer in this data set that they have. And the data, the attribute data that's included in the summary files gets aggregated at each one of these different levels of detail. So you can get census data uh, for an entire county, which is pretty commonly found on the internet, or you can get it down into these finer levels of detail, including again the census tracts, census block groups, and census blocks. Now, one of the caveats about the census blocks dimension is that not all the data is available at that level of detail. Um, specifically, if there's data that might identify people on an individual basis, for example, you might have a minority population that lives on a city block, and some of the census data that could be presented would make it obvious that it's pertaining to those people because there are so few of them that live on that block. Um, so in those kind of cases when the level of detail is going to be so fine that the Census Bureau is concerned that people might be able to identify individuals with that information then they don't include it. It's basically a not available uh, field in the database. 
So things like income, for example, is typically not found at the census block level of detail. But population numbers usually are. Again, except in those rare cases where there's so few people that they might identify them individually. So the census blocks are good in that it's a, it's a lot finer level of detail, but you might find that some information is not available at that level. This same with the block groups, though it's, it's more widely available at that level. And then the census tracts is, is most all of the uh, field attributes in the uh, summary files are, are available for that level of detail on upward. So you can go from the census tracts, you can go to the counties. They have information in here uh, by uh, congressional district boundaries. They have state level of detail of course and uh, what else? They have school districts and they have voting districts. Um, now some of the attribute data for some of these levels of details might be a little bit challenging. Now on the ESRI site they have them available you can see here for the census blocks and they call it the, census, the demographics and for now just ignore this PL94. We'll talk more about that in the 220 class. We don't usually use that. That's one of the first levels of detail that comes out of the census when it's made available. The census you'll find makes the data from its most recent collection survey they'll make that data available spread out over a period of time. The PL is for Public Law 94 and that is uh, is uh, data that was created to satisfy legal requirements that's placed upon the Census Bureau. What we're usually interested in is this SF1 data and so you have to be careful when you download this set of data to, to make sure that you get it uh, for the for the SF1 and not the PL94. And you can see we can we could get this for the blocks. Um, we can get it for the counties, of course. Um, they have some uh, information at the place level of detail, which would be oftentimes cities, larger communities, over 10,000 people usually. Um, the state level of detail and the census tracts. And we have the block groups tucked in here too. So we can get it from, from those levels of detail, but you don't see the voting districts here for example. You don't see congressional districts here for example. So it's a little tougher to get the data in terms of the attribute data for that level of detail. You can get the bounding polygon. So if you're doing a project related to uh, identifying the voting precincts then you can get the boundaries for that information from the tiger files. So again the way to think of this is is you've got you've got shapefile data and you've got attribute data. So you've got the, the tiger files themselves that contains all of the boundaries and the features and then you've got the summary file attribute data which has to be associated with those files before it can be used. The way you associate that is by doing a table join which you're seeing in the Getting to Know ArcGIS textbook um, this week and so you're, you're learning about that now. And so we'll demonstrate how to do that a little later on in another, another exercise. But for now, we're going to focus on just obtaining um, the, the tiger data itself and talk a little more about that. And looking through the list again here, you can see in addition to some of the features we've already mentioned, there's other information here that the Census Bureau uses mainly for cartographic purposes, but also to some extent to help define some of these other boundaries that we talked about earlier. For example, they have hydrography, which is all of the streams in an area. They'll have landmarks, which uh, landmarks tends to be hit or miss. In some counties, it seems like it has more details than others. Um, and it may be, you know, it may range from some kind of historic landmark to maybe a school or something like that. Um, then we've got miscellaneous transportation features which is kinda like the some of this is getting similar to the DOG data that we've worked with before again some of these are hit or miss uh, certain counties will have more information in them than others um, roads is a very good one and that's one that I want to mention because that's a very popular one uh, the roads are pretty complete um, they uh, they don't have like the trails for example but they'll have most of most of your roads even even gravel roads the school districts again it's kind of hit or miss it depends on the uh, extent to which that data was provided at a county level 
Um, some of this data is influenced by the counties themselves and so some counties submit that information some don't some have districts some don't so that's a little bit hit or miss um, the legislative districts um, usually uh, um, for the state level usually pretty good and again we have the congressional districts as well and urban areas um, can be a little hit or miss it just depends on your area of interest if you are working in a more uh, developed region then this might be a valuable layer voting districts um, the same depends on the project water polygons is pretty good now water polygons will contain all of the lakes for example in a county and so you'll have large bodies of waters there and so it's very handy to get that one along with the hydrography data you might want to get both of those if you're looking for water related features for a project for example Typically, the ones I'll get the most that that I seem to to use the most are the roads features, um, the water polygons, the hydrography. I'm trying to highlight these as we go, <laughs> and uh, and then some level of detail. A lot of times I'll get the county because I want to have a county boundary um, for a, a project that I'm working on. I usually disregard the 1990 data. You very rarely have a need to compare 1990 with 2000 in terms of the spatial attributes. Um, sometimes when you're looking at the summary file data you'll compare the two but uh, but the summary file data tends to be available um, more for the 2000 data anyway. Though I, I, I do think they might have a 1990 data in there for overall population. And then, of course, you know, I, I'll get some level of detail, either the tracks, the block groups, or the blocks, depending on my project. So sometimes I find that I use this data just to get, uh, just to have the polygon information. I'm not really interested in the actual census data, the attribute data, other than maybe the names and stuff. You know, for example, I'm not interested maybe in the census data for a certain project, but I need a, a set of roads for my project, or I need the water features. Now one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that one of the advantages of this data set over the DOG data, for example, in terms of the hydrography and the roads and the water polygons, is that there is attribute data contained in there that gives the names of a lot of those features. So if you're looking for the name of the streams, um, this is a good data source. And the DOG data is more precise than this data but it doesn't have the names in it so you sort of got a trade-off there and I think we mentioned this before but uh, but there's a trade-off there the DLG data gives you more accuracy and more levels of detail especially with the hydrography but it doesn't include the names and so in this system you'll find some entities don't have a name associated with them but there there are a lot of names in there and it can be very useful for that purpose the same with the roads and uh, later when we look at some of the attribute data with this you'll see uh, you'll see that information and that's included for these layers that's included with just the tiger data itself you don't have to get the summary file data to get that information so that's a that's a big advantage of having this data it's pretty easy to obtain and you're basically going to get this data from this source at the county level of detail so unlike the quad level of detail like we've been using here you'll get the county but it's typically not a problem because as you can see looking at these file sizes this is for Cumberland County which is I think the third or fourth largest county in the state so uh, the file sizes are not that bad for example the roads are less than um, are less than uh, looks like less than a megabyte so um, you know that's now these will come down zipped up a little bit or they'll be come down zipped up as well so some of these sizes might be a little larger once you unzip everything but still it's it's much more manageable than say getting the entire county of raster data for example <laughs> so because it's vector data the sizes are usually not an issue by getting them at the county level of detail and then later you'll learn how to do a clip and you can always clip these out to fit your study area if you need to so that's an introduction to the Tiger data itself. Um, it's kind of quick and quick and dirty here, but uh, we'll talk, like I say, a lot more about this in the 220 class. But this is a very, very handy data 
source and getting them from the Esri site here again is very advantageous in that they are already processed for you. You don't have to run a utility to convert them into a shape file. And you do have um, some of the attribute data available as well. So that's just a quick introduction to the site. Um, there is some other, there's some PDF files here of interest. Some of these are really large. For example, this U.S. Census Summary File 1 um, comes from the Census Bureau, and it's a very large technical document that describes every variable in the summary file data. A lot of this is, is overkill for what we're doing. ESRI also includes, when you download any of this information, they will include a README file with your download. Now, what happens when you download these, you check the box over here next to the layers you want. So say I want County 2000, I'm going to check that. And maybe the water polygons and the hydrography and the roads. Okay. And let's say I don't need any of the attribute data right now. So when I, when I go to download, proceed to download, what it basically does is on the server, they are zipping up the data that I checked off into one zip file and I, it's processed it for me and you can see I can click this to download the file which I'll go ahead and do that real quick and you can see the whole file is only 1.2 megabytes for all of that data so I'm just going to save this out they've already named it with this long kind of confusing name we'll go ahead and save that so remember I downloaded what did I have three different layers I had water or four. I had the county, I had water bodies, I had the hydrography, and the roads. Now all four of those are zipped up in this one zip file. So I'm going to unzip that and they're basically double zipped as you'll see when this unzips here. You can see what it, they've done is they've taken each of the four layers that I was interested in and zipped those up individually and then they've zipped up all those zip files into one zip. <laughs> so it's kind of double zipped. So I could, and I typically do this, I like to save, as we mentioned before, my original zip files, but I don't need the double zip file as well. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that out of here. And now I've got my four original zip files, and you see they included a readme file. Now if I unzip these original zip files, which I can unzip them one at a time, or a shortcut you can do with uh, WinZip and probably 7-Zip too, I'm not sure, highlight all of those, right click on any one of those, go to WinZip and extract to here and it will unzip all four of those for me at once. So that saves me some time and conveniently they're all highlighted as well so if I want to move those to an archive folder I can cut those out of here and paste them over into an archive folder to save some space which you'll probably want to do on your end when you're doing this on projects. And so you'll see I've got each of those and you'll see the DBF file the shape file and an SHX file with each. Okay. Now keep in mind that we always want to check these in our catalog to make sure if they have been defined or not. And I can tell you that for this data source, they have not been defined. And you do not see a PRJ, a .prj file in here, which is one clue that they've not been defined. So you'll have to define all of these in Arc catalog before you use them in Arc map. It's very, very important that you do that before you use them in ArcMap. And remember from back at the beginning the projection you want to use for these is um, a geographic coordinate system with a 1983 datum. Okay, So that's GCS North America datum 1983 and that's the projection you want to use for these when you define them. Now I wanted to point out this readme file before we end and the readme file is basically a uh, uh, type of metadata that's explaining a little bit of information about the files themselves. Let me uh, see if I can set my screen up here to where you can see both of these at once. Okay, we've got in, in this in this readme file they give you a lot of file naming abbreviations which you'll find Esri has abbreviated a lot of the census names uh, for you um, in a way that fits their organizational scheme. Um, the Census Bureau typically uses very long names and a lot of times they're just numbers and so they're very hard to understand and what Esri has done is converted a lot of those names uh, to include some abbreviations to help you 
identify the file types. So you see, for example, in this file, the member we downloaded county was one of the layers. And this is the uh, the three files that goes with the county layer. And you see they all begin with TGR for Tiger, then 47035. Now, this is a FIPS code, uh, F-I-P-S, FIPS code. And 47 is the FIPS code for Tennessee, and 035 is the FIPS code for Cumberland County. Now, we'll talk more about FIPS codes in the 220 class, but just think of it for now as it's very similar to a zip code. It's just a, basically a unique coding system that the Census Bureau has assigned, and they'll assign a FIPS code to every entity that they work with. So you'll find that every city has a FIPS code, every county has a FIPS code, and so forth. So 035 is the FIPS code for Cumberland County, and then CTY for county. And if you look over here in this list over here, you'll see CTY is uh, is highlighted. They've got it for county uh, 1990. Okay, and actually it's CTY00, so CTY00 is for County 2000. So you can know at a glance then that that is the Tiger file for 2000 County, and if you knew the FIPS codes, you'd know it's 47 is Tennessee and 035 is Cumberland County. And if I think of it, I'll try to post a link on our website that takes you to the explanation of the FIPS codes. So you at least have something you can look them up with. Should you have some files ever that, that gets misplaced in your, in your hard drive somewhere, for example, that you did not name in a way that you can keep up with. What I'll typically do is instead of using like test for this folder name, I would have maybe called this uh, um, abbreviated Cumberland or something like that so it would remind me that this was Cumberland County. And of course I would put it into a Tiger, T-I-G-E-R folder and probably an Esri subfolder to differentiate that it came from Esri. But here I was just trying to set it up so you could look at them real quickly. So that's the naming scheme. That's what's in this README file, so it's handy for that. And I guess that's I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it there. Um, we'll be practicing this with uh, exercise three, and you'll probably see this on the exams. Uh, working with this data, so you're gonna have plenty of chances to actually use the data. Here, I mainly just wanted to explain a little bit about what the Tiger data was about, and show you a, a handy data source where you can download this information for free and one that's set up but uh, in a format that works very well for this class and like I mentioned at the beginning you will be seeing the Tiger data directly from the Census Bureau as well a little later if not in this class then in the 220 class so we'll leave it there for now and uh, feel free to uh, follow along the links and download some data and try some of this out We'll, again, we'll be working with this in exercise three, so it'll give you a chance to see this, and we'll compare this data with the DLG data, so you can sort of see some of the things that I talked about earlier in terms of the accuracy of both and, and the names and the attribute information and so forth.